I mean, there was literally just thousands of people everywhere. Not just people, cars. They were parked everywhere on grass, just people everywhere, everywhere. People had camped out on top of their cars, so there was no place for people to sleep. There were no hotels or anything like that. So people slept in their cars, slept on the hood of their cars. And uh, the first thing I'm thinking, how in the hell am I going to find my wife in the midst of 10 to 15,000 people? <laughs> how in the hell? Funny story. Funny story. So when I when I actually went to the Philippines uh, to try to, you know, uh, you know, say goodbye to my grandfather, um, my wife had a cousin that, that she was in the States, I believe, but she came to the Philippines to visit. And I had never met her before. I had never met her before. Um, so she went and stayed with my wife, you know, a couple of days or however long it was. And I think she ended up, uh, I think she, she ended up evacuating with my wife, I think. She she stayed with my wife and hung with her, make sure she's okay. They loaded up the vehicle and they, they drove the 45 minutes. And the 45 minutes ended up being about four and a half, five hours. That's how long it took. That's just the, the, the amount of cars they were on the roads trying to get uh, to this Navy base. Uh, keep in mind, everybody had um, were ordered to evacuate. I mean, they were ordered to leave everything. Don't take furniture. Just take, if anything, just take your, you know, take some clothes just for a couple of days. Take your important paperwork. Because for some reason, some folks were thinking it would just be a precautionary thing. And they'd go back home after a couple of days. And that was not the case. So my wife's cousin, the only... Uh, she knew me through a photo. My wife showed her photos of who I was and, and, and everything. And uh, when we, when that when that van or that that bus turned the corner and we saw those people, I'm like, oh my goodness, how am I gonna find my wife? Let alone, what, what am I gonna do? You know what I mean? I got bags. It's like I can't I can't go home. I mean, I never forget. I got off the I got off the bus, and I may have man, I, it, it probably was no more than ten minutes, man. No more than ten minutes. By the, by the grace of God, man, she remembered me from that photo. She happened to be over in the area, and she saw me. She saw me. In the midst of 10 to 15,000 people, she saw me get off that bus. Because my wife was somewhere else, but she had went to, I think, get some food or something. And it was just so happened, again, by the grace of God, that, that she saw me get off that bus. And then she came over to me and she said, you Jesus' husband? I said, yeah, I am. She said, come on, come on with me. I, I'll show you where she is. And, and keep in mind, the 20 or 30 of us on this bus, we're just still totally confused. We're just like, what in the world? So she took me to my wife, and my wife, her car was parked on, on in the middle of a field or something, just on some grass or something like that. You know, and she did her due diligence. She loaded the car with all the important paperwork, the documents and everything, um, a few clothes, you know, things like that. But not a whole lot, not a whole lot. So... Um, I immediately got with her, made sure she was okay, made sure her cousin was okay. And I think her cousin ended up leaving, I think, a couple of days later, if I'm not mistaken, uh, maybe a day or two later. And I'm kind of blanking on it, I'm talking 33 years, 34 this June. So I got with my wife, and then the next thing we had to do was try to figure out, okay, we need to find somewhere to stay. So we ended up going um, off the Navy base, about 10 minutes off the base. We actually found a, a, a little decent little... I don't know if it was a hotel or motel or what it was, but it had a room and had running water, had a shower and a bed, you know, and that's all we needed. And so we ended up uh, going there and putting our, you know, belongings there and uh, and just trying to get settled in the best we can. Okay, and then it was time for us, we had to venture out to figure out, okay, how are we gonna eat? <laughs> because 10 to 15,000 people, it's not enough food in that, that, that area for those folks. And so people did the best they could. There were some restaurants, but you know, Man, it was very thin pickings, and they ended up running out of food. Um, and then there was the issue of, of people not having money to even uh, buy food. So what the military did, they had people from what's called a finance office uh, literally set up um, like a little area where you would go over there, tell them your name, and then they 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 give you cash money. I mean, they, they dropped three dollars $400 on you right then. And I think every, I want to see every, uh, I think I want to see every day or every other day they would give you some money um, just to survive because you needed food, you needed, you know, 
protect the kids, but I mean, people with children and diapers. And so it's just a mess, man. And so I'll never forget we would go get this money. And I'm walking around with all this cash money with nothing to do with it because there was no food to buy. We ended up finding some, you know, food. Don't get me wrong, but uh, it was not your typical Sunday meal. I <laughs> put it to you like that. Um, so the, the next, I believe the next day, uh, my wife and I were, um, we had, after we'd settled in at the, the hotel, when we ventured out, I noticed the car needed gas. It needed gas in the vehicle. So what we did was went to a gas station on, on the base, uh, filled up the car, and here's where everything went south. So as soon as we filled up the vehicle with gas, we drove out of the gas station parking lot. I'll never forget, we drove out of the gas station parking lot. Next thing you know, we started hearing these sounds, like blink, 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 blink. And what it was, it was rocks. There were, there were literally rocks falling out of the sky. There was rocks falling out of the sky. And uh, what happened was uh, Pinatubo was great, getting ready to do his thing. It, it, was, it was getting ready to, to blow. The crazy thing about this is there was also a typhoon that was coming our way. I think it was typhoon. I can't remember the name of the typhoon. I'm not even going to sit here and try to play around with that. But there was a, it was a, I think they call it a super typhoon. Super typhoon is a very strong typhoon. It's, it's a hurricane. Put it like that. It's a hurricane stateside, but over in the uh, Pacific, a typhoon. So we're driving out of the gas station parking lot. We had this blink, 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 blink. Next thing you know, dirt started falling out of the sky. And the windshields were getting covered up. And everybody on the road was stopping and, and trying to wipe the stuff off and drive and wrap it off. So finally got to the point where we just made it to a location and we just kind of parked the car. Because that, you couldn't drive. I mean, it was, it was crazy. Imagine mud or, or you know, dirt falling out of the sky with rocks and uh, with rain on it. You know, so um, we parked the car and we, we actually started walking around trying to make our way, trying to find place to, um, you know, get comfortable because we, we, we couldn't go anywhere. And I never forget, we went to a place that they, they end up making it the command center for the Air Force Base on this Navy base. It was at a, was called the NCO Club. NCO Club is basically, it's a restaurant, bar, entertainment. Uh, they have meetings there, and all sorts of, you know, cool little things. And so everybody was, there were a few folks there, and so we decided to go there because we heard there was food there. And what, what shocked me when we went there, we saw, um, you know, all these ranking ranking guys, high-ranking guys, you know, colonels and, and you know, all this. And, and these guys, you know, beards and stubbles, which is unheard of military, but they were, I mean, they were, they did a damn good job of, uh, you know, keeping communication with, with decent, with, um, the folks in the states and uh, higher headquarters, and um, it was just the craziest thing, man. So we sat there for a little while, and while we were while we were at, the, at this the NCO club, non commissioned officers club, the volcano blew. It erupted, and it erupted, and it erupted, and I'm blanking on the time, but it was it was clear as day outside. It was like Man, I'm gonna say two o'clock in the afternoon, or something like that. But when that thing blew, um, not only could you feel it, it turned dark. It was pitch black outside, like pitch black. And we all couldn't stand in the seal club. We had to go try to, you know, uh, make our way somewhere else, or, you know, to safety or something like that. So um, I never forget we left the in seal club. And they said, hey, we got space over in the gym across the street. If y'all want to, some of you want to go to the gym, just come on with me. And there was a guy, I never forget a guy. He said, it was so dark, man. Two o'clock in the afternoon, I mean, pitch dark. The reason it was dark is because when the volcano blew, the ash literally covered the sky. I mean, it, it covered the sky. Uh, it didn't stop the rocks and the, and the dirt from falling. It was crazy. But he said, if y'all want to go over to the gym, there's a space over there, you can lay down and maybe be safe or whatever. So the only way to get over to the gym, we had to literally, there was about 15 or 20 of us. He said, everybody, please hold on to the back of each other's shirt. We had to hold the back of each other's shirt. 
because you that you couldn't see you couldn't see a thing. So, but he had a flashlight. You know what I'm saying? So he was guiding us over, and we're, we're, we're walking, and just everybody's in shock and like not understanding what's going on. The damn ground is shaking. The, the ground was shaking because of the volcano, but it, it created earthquakes, constant earthquakes, constant, constant, constant earthquakes. Okay, we went over to the, he got us over to the gym. Man, we were in the gym probably 30 minutes, 30 minutes in the gym. And my goodness, the gym ended up, it started to collapse. The roof started to collapse. And we got out just in time um, because it did collapse. And it, it, it brings tears to my eyes to even think about it. But uh, a small child lost his, their life in, the, in that uh, the gym. The roof fell on the family and killed the small child. And so, uh, you know, prayers up to that family even to this day, man. It was just, it was just traumatic. Uh, always when you lose a, a small child like that. So we left the gym and somebody said, hey, go over to these other buildings over here um, and you could probably sleep on the, in the hallways, in the dorm, dormitories. And so they allowed us to sleep on the floor of the dormitories, uh, the Navy folks who were there, where they slept, the, the single folks in dorms and things like that. So we literally was, was laying on dirty carpet and you name it. And it got so bad, they said we had to leave there because they didn't know the ash was so heavy on roofs that it was collapsing roofs. You couldn't see, it's pitch dark. Uh, the ground is shaking like crazy. You got a super typhoon coming in that's carrying that ash over from Mount Pinatuba right on top of us, <laughs> it was, it, right on top of us. And so um, when we left the dormitory, we left the dormitory and it, it to me, it seemed like we were going place to place to place to place, just trying to figure out somewhere safe, somewhere that was not collapsing. You know, literally, we were, we were fighting for survival. And um, the um, the next day, um, when things kind of cleared up, I don't want to say cleared up, meaning it got better. What I'm saying is it cleared up. Um, you could see. You know the ash had dissipated where well, you can kind of see you could see it daylight you know so and it was just it was a surreal it was just unreal what i saw what we saw i'm talking about all the twenty thousand folks that were evacuated from uh, the philippines keep in mind there were 10 to fifteen thousand, probably from clark i think another five thousand. you had army guys there navy from other bases around there and everything like that so the destruction was just unimaginable. It was unimaginable. Everything, you look around, everything was gray. Everything was gray. You couldn't even see some vehicles they were covered in so much ash. I mean, some vehicles, the ash came all the way up to the window of the vehicle. That's just how, how much ash was dumped on us and rocks and things like that. So somehow we made it back. Uh, we went back to get our vehicle. And I said, to hell with it. I'm driving this thing. I, You know, because... I guess other folks are doing the same thing. And so um, we're slipping and sliding and driving. And, and we get back to the that motel where we actually had our personal things that we decided to stay at. And guess what? The folks at the front desk had taken our stuff. They had taken all of our stuff out of the room. I guess they, they probably thought that we were not coming back, you know, uh, our destruction. But let me tell you, my wife was livid. When I say livid, I just stepped back and let her have it because it was Filipino. She's Filipino. She started talking their language to Gala. She lit into them hard about taking the stuff. So we got our stuff out of the, um, from the hotel, loaded up in the vehicle. And I don't know how, but I ended up running into my friend Amos. Well, Amos had been with me because they, Amos turned up the guy I graduated from high school with. He, um, he was also in, in the volcano. You know, in fact, he was he was with us and we were kind of moving from place to place to place. And the crazy thing about what happened with him, he was at another location, um, another safe place, which is probably a 45 minute drive away. So you had people going to different locations when they uh, evacuated everyone. He went to probably an army base or something like that. But what was crazy that he left his small child. They had a newborn. The child was probably two years old, man. But they had to leave the newborn with someone there in the hands of some good friends because they had to go and find food. And uh, obviously, um, it, it, it took both of them to go to find the food because, you know, Amos is American. He, he, he can, you know, 
um, you know, uh, talk the lingo with the military folks to figure out what's going on. And his wife's Filipino. She could speak to, you know, some of the Filipinos, find food, whatever, yada, yada, yada. So, fast forward, when we, get, when we went to the hotel to get our, our luggage and everything out of the hotel. After my wife laid into some, she laid into to some. <laughs> so we got in the car, i never forget, um, my friend Amos, I don't know how we ended up hooking back up again, but he came up and they were distraught, man. Him and his wife were just distraught. They were distraught because it wasn't just the volcano, it wasn't just the earthquake, it wasn't just the typhoon. Their child, man, their child, they wanted to get near their child. And so I made the, the decision, um, looking back on it, it was a stupid decision, but that's who I am. I mean, I'm all about, you know, um, helping others, you know, and that was a huge sacrifice that, that I made because what we end up doing, we end up going towards the destruction. So we end up driving toward the destruction to get to his child. And this ride typically is about 45 minutes, but it took us probably three hours, three and a half hours to get there. But on the way there, on the way there, I want to back up, on the way there, as we left out of the Navy base to head to, toward his child, I would never forget this. I would never forget this. We come up to the gate. There's a gate go right there. He says, hey, where you guys going? I'm like, man, we, we're getting the hell out of here, man. We're going to go. This guy's kids, he said, man, you know, you're not supposed to be out there. I said, man, whatever. I'm going to get my homeboy's child. You know what I'm saying? I never forget as we, before we pulled off from the gate guard out the gate, there was a lady in white. I would never forget this in my life. She was just in tears and she was just covered in blood. She was, her whole midsection was just covered in blood. Just covered in blood. And she was sitting, she was looking for help. She was trying to get the gate guard to let her on the base, which is not allowed, obviously, you know, for security reasons. But she was Philippine national and they tried. He wouldn't let her go on the base. And I never forget, I engaged the guys. Hey, man, this lady is, look at her, man. And long story short, she had a miscarriage. She had a miscarriage and she was alone. And she had a white uh, dress or something on. And it was just full of blood, man. I, didn't, I never forget that. It hurt my heart to see that. And, and the gate guard, I finally got him to um, at least, I said, man, at least call somebody, man. You can't just leave her like this, man. You know, call somebody, man. You know what I'm saying? I understand it's curtain and everything, man. This is a human life and everybody's trying to survive out here. So we ended up driving off and, man, I, I hated just leaving that lady like that. I hated leaving that lady like that. But there's only so much I could do. And as we drove away, about 20 minutes uh, away from the, the, the uh, gate, the vehicle got stuck in, in ash, in ash on the road leading back up to his, where his baby was. And I'll never forget, there was a, a guy that came over. He saw us stuck. He came over to help us um, get, he came to help us get the vehicle out of this ash and so it can get rolling again. But guess what? He also left his child in the same location. He was Navy. He was a Navy guy. He just had tears in his, just tears, man. There's no way in hell I was going to leave that guy like that. And knowing his child was uh, at the same location we were heading to with my friend's child. And also we needed the extra help in case the vehicle got stuck. And so he pleaded with us, please can I go with y'all? So I said, yeah, come on. So I had me driving, my wife on the passenger side. We've got my homeboy and his girl in the back and then the Navy guy in the back uh, of the vehicle and the trunk and everything else loaded up with everything. It wasn't a big car, a mid-sized car. On that road, we must have we must have gotten stuck probably, and I'm not even exaggerating, we got stuck probably 10 to 15 times in the ash. And every time we got stuck, we would have to get out and push, get out and push. And there was even a point where the ladies even got out to kind of help because it was, it, this ash was pretty thick. It was pretty thick. And um, we 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 would make our way. We get stuck. We get out and try to get this thing out of the ash. And I never forget this man. As we began driving, people were walking away from where we were going to. So where we were going, there was nobody going our direction because that's where the danger was. Everybody was walking away. All the Filipinos, all the locals, they were walking away with everything and carrying their bags. And I never forget, man. There were a lot of Filipinos on the side pointing at us and saying stuff like blah, 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 blah. And I asked my wife and my, my homegirl, 
Homeboy's girl, what are they saying? He said, basically, they're calling y'all stupid American. <laughs> so y'all are stupid. You're stupid. You're going up there. You're going where, where the danger is. And, you know, anybody knows me when I have my, my heart set to something, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it, man, if it's for good. So I ignored all that, and we, we I mean, we called it people. Y'all stupid. You stupid Americans. You blah, blah, blah. And so we kept going. We kept going. We kept going. And it got to the point where we didn't see anyone else. We were like out there by ourselves. Literally, everything was gray. The trees were gray. The ground was gray. It, it, everything was just gray, like gray snow. We're driving. And this, when I really start to say, Eric, man, you made a stupid decision <laughs> to be out here like this. But again, my heart was in the right place. I wanted to get this man next, you know, back with his child. I wanted to get my friend back with his child. And that's all that mattered to me. And, um, but it got to a point where we saw no one. I mean, it was just us out there driving. And we, again, we kept getting stuck and stopped and stuck and, and you know, getting the vehicle out. And um, i never forget, it started getting real quiet in the car. First, everybody was kind of talking, and it got quiet in the car. It got quiet. Because we realized that we were in grave danger being out there. If the vehicle had stopped where we were, we would have been, I mean, out of there because there was, we couldn't walk back, it was, you know, and darkness would have hit. We didn't have food, water, none of that, man. So well, we had a little water in the car, but we didn't have any food. So we just kept driving, man. We kept driving, we kept driving, we kept driving. We drove so much to where the wheels, you could hear the, the, the ash inside the brake drum just squealing. And just, I didn't give a damn. I was trying to get, you know, these, these folks to their children. Um, but it got quiet in the car because we all became, I ain't gonna lie, I was just like, I wasn't scared. I think I was more in shock over what was happening with, keep in mind the ground's still moving. The, the earthquakes never stopped. So the, the volcano was still doing its thing. It wasn't full blown eruption. The full blown eruption had happened, but it was having these mini eruptions. So it was just constant, the ground constant shaking, constant shaking, constant shaking. And then you got the hurricane, I mean the uh, typhoon coming in. So we finally made it to the location um, where my friend's child was and the Navy guy's child was. And I think it was an army base or something. We get to the front gate. And, and, and this is when I knew a guy had my back. When we got to the front gate, as soon as we drove through the gate, as soon as we drove in the gate, because the gate guard wasn't at the gate, he was back off a little bit in a big truck. As soon as we drove through that gate, the entire car just collapsed. Oof. It just collapsed. The whole axle just broke. Oof. 